<clears throat> to Innovation Bay's Wednesday morning uh, event series. Uh, I'm your host, Ian Gardner. Uh, we're on a new platform, so um, uh, forgive the slight uh, fumbling here. Um, we've been doing this for quite a long time, but this is the first time in Hopin, so I'll tell you about that in a sec. Um, yeah, I'm your regular host, I'm, uh, Ian Gardner, as I say, I'm a co-founder at Innovation Bay, I'm also an investment partner with uh, Gelix Ventures. Uh, also in the Innovation Bay team, we have Faden Stow, uh, my co-founder, Shan, Claire, Sam, CJ and Alison. Uh, thanks to all of them. Uh, we are working pretty hard to support and connect the startup ecosystem across Australia. Um, look, thanks everyone for joining us this morning. Uh, we are excited uh, that we're using a brand new platform, Hopin. Uh, I think well, there's certainly some Zoom fatigue out there, so we thought it was fairly one-dimensional. This brings a couple more dimensions to it, which, uh, which we'll get to later. So following the event, there is going to be some virtual networking. Uh, which we'll explain more about later, a little bit like chat roulette, but uh, hopefully without a bunch of uh, creepy dudes on there. Um, so if you're not familiar with Innovation Bay, we are the longest running community for founders and investors across Australia. Uh, our mission is to support founders on their journey from idea to IPO and beyond. Uh, and we do this through a range of events, programs and content, all designed uh, to enable you to connect, learn and grow. So a little bit about uh, this hop-in platform that we're on today. Um, you know, it's a little bit designed to exp uh, you know, offer an experience like you would a physical event. Uh, you kind of choose where to go, except for now when we're forcing you to, to watch the, the main stage, which is what we're at, where we are. Um, so this is the main stage. Uh, this is where we're going to do the panel discussion in a minute. Uh, after the event, we're going to open up the sessions and virtual networking. Uh, and you'll be able to, you know, a little bit like you would at a physical event, you can go and sort of, you know, sit in a room and, and listen to others or participate. Um, so there'll, there'll be two sessions, uh, which is a breakout room, and that'll have up to nine people each one. Uh, but more people can participate through the chat or you can just uh, watch. Uh, and if you want the second type of speed networking, which is randomly to meet another attendee one to one, I think you get three minutes and they'll kick you out um, or take you on to the next one, but you can extend it uh, and you can share details. So we're going to give it a try. Um, we tried it for another event a couple of weeks ago and it was really, really good. So uh, pretty excited about that. Um, there's no Q&A function, so we still want questions from you. Uh, there's a good chat function on the right hand side of your screen. So if you have a question for the panel, stick it in there and uh, we'll, we'll try and get to it. Um, Big thank you as ever to our national sponsors. So we have AWS, IAG, Farmark Ventures, uh, KPMG's High Growth Ventures and uh, Macquarie Bank. So uh, they support us, Innovation Bay, and they support uh, the entire startup ecosystem. So uh, thank you uh, to all of them. So just before we meet the panel, just a little bit about the, the topic today. Uh, you know, every company needs cash uh, to operate, uh, as we all know. Uh, now, the normal, using quote marks there, options to get cash as an early stage technology startup are either through equity, uh, you know, venture uh, or debt, um, which, you know, is becoming a, a little more common. Uh, but there is another option, uh, which seems obvious, uh, which is, you know, uh, get a product, uh, sell it to a customer and get them to pay you. You know, sounds a bit old fashioned, maybe, uh, but, you know, there's pros and cons of both approaches, uh, and we're going to explore that in, in this session. Um, we have brought together some of the best people around the start startup ecosystem for this. Uh, some you may have heard of and some that you may not have heard of, but they, they really are uh, a, a bunch of great people and they have a great story to tell. Right, let me uh, kill my slides. Uh, and I'm going to ask the panel to join us on the main stage. So uh, come on in, everyone. Look at that. Matt wins the prize for the fastest uh, quick draw. So, James, uh, Noel, welcome. We just need Lachlan. I'm just messaging Lox. He may be having uh, blank screen issues. He'll be with us shortly. All ah, right. Okay. Well, we can uh, we can get started uh, without him. Um, now, I'm going to do. I'm here. Uh, Sorry, folks. Oh, there you are. <laughs> you worked out. Yeah. Yeah, all right. we're, all we're completely blank seconds before before I was supposed to walk in. That was a test. We passed. <laughs> uh, all right, yeah. let me give a quick intro to each of you, and then we'll we'll start getting into it. So, um, James Kuda, um, you may not have heard of James. Uh, James is from Tasmania, all the way in Hobart. So he runs a company called Savage Interactive. 
Uh, <clears throat> they are the developers of the number one creative app for the iPad, which has also got a terrific name. It's called Procreate. Um, he's, uh, yeah, he's done all of this from Hobart, Tasmania. You co-founded the business with your wife, Alana, in 2011. You've now got over 40 staff, uh, just unbelievable growth, really, in the last 18 months or so. But all the way through, it's just been a, a terrific story. Uh, and you've never taken any external funding. So we'll, we'll talk about um, that. Uh, Noel, welcome. Uh, delighted to have you. You're a co-founder of Team Gage. Um, you're also a member of our Summit Club, um, which is a, a club for Series A and beyond startups. Uh, so uh, and you've been a terrific member there. Uh, Team Gage software solution that helps teams continuously improve the way they work together. Uh, you're based in Adelaide. Uh, you started the company, another husband and wife team with your husband, Ben, back in 2016. So um, yeah, welcome, uh, Noel. Uh, Auckland Donald, uh, you're the CEO and co-founder at, at BuildCout. Uh, BuildCout builds automation software for developers to move faster and ship better products. Uh, you've been around since 2014. Uh, you joined as an investor in 2017, and I think you moved into the CEO role in late 2019. So uh, some really good parts of that story too, which we'll get into. Uh, and of course, Matt. Uh, Matt is probably well known to you all. Uh, and me, we used to um, work together on the AWS startup team for a couple of years, uh, which is a lot of fun. Uh, Matt's a great guy. Uh, Ex-software dev, ex-technical co-founder, ex-tech recruiter, as I say, AWS. And now he's an investor, advisor, and a board member. Uh, he does like VC, uh, but he particularly loves founders building solid and doing tech companies. Uh, and he believes that not all ambitious founders need venture capital. All right, I have been talking for way long enough, so let's get to the panel. So Matt, let's start with you, because I think you've got a sort of, you know, you've done everything. Uh, you've got a macro perspective, but you've been passionate about this. I think uh, ever since I've known you, you've talked about bootstrapping and why you love it so much. That, like, tell us why. Yeah, I think like initially it's probably a good idea to just sort of put a bit of a definition around bootstrapped. You know, in, in um, in our view, a bootstrap company um, is one where the company's running out of customer, customer revenue sooner rather than later. Um, you know, purists might suggest that they have no external capital in them at all, but we think that, you know, founders have a, um, uh, founders who have an open mind as to how to get started um, is really important. Can I just jump um, in and say, know, whoever's got the, 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 we love screaming children, but whoever's got that, maybe oh, just. Oh, that's, that's locked. You. you want to, you want to yeah. be there for a bit yeah. longer? No, that's all right. Look, uh, we, we love it, but, uh, and especially when you're talking, but uh, maybe when Matt is, we can go and mute. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, purists might suggest that, that there's no external capital in the mall. We don't, we don't think that's true. We think that, you know, um, the crossover point is two things, is really when you take capital from other people who have promised results to other people. Um, and, and, you know, from a revenue perspective, we can run it out of, out of revenue. But the main thing that I like is um, it's all about optionality, right? When you when you are control or in control of your your company, you get to choose what you do next. You know, if you're running off customer revenue and you're able to keep your your costs low, then you get the choice. You know, the choice as to whether or not you fuel up with other people's money and go faster. The choice whether or not you, you know, you run frugal for longer. Um, and that optionality is really really important. And um, you know, just to reiterate, like. I actually love VC. I'm an LP in several funds. Uh, you know, I can only do what I do because of VC. Um, but, you know, the founders that we tend, tend to gravitate towards are ones that kind of run their businesses more like a business. Um, and having that optionality to, to really sort of double down on it if they want to um, is, is their choice and not because they've made promises to anyone else, you know, yet. Yeah. All right, look, that's great. I mean, look, there's there's tons more to the story that we'll 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 jump to from you. Uh, look, James, I might um, move over to to you. Um, you know, I'd love to to get a bit more of the backstory and procreate and um, and, and savage your your, your company. Uh, you know, it's a bit of an unsung hero of the star Aussie startup ecosystem. You know, it's just been done quietly. I think if it wasn't for Faden, uh, is my co-founder down there hanging out with you now and again in coffee shops, then we you know we may not have heard of you. Uh, I mean, what what has been the secret to to this? Uh, uh, are the pros and cons of running under the radar like you have? So yeah, just maybe give us a, a bit of the Procreate story. Yeah, I mean, from my mind, when we started out, uh, yeah, there was probably no secret. It was probably there was probably just a, a bit of naivety about the um, the software industry. From from my point of view, we were just building a business, and so it had to be profitable from day one. Um, you know, we started up in the house to keep the cost down, and we were in the house for couple of years running pretty much on a 
you know, on a wet rag, really. It was pretty tough. You know, I took probably one of the lowest wages in there. It was really hard to try and find people. But uh, this, I think one of, the, one of the interesting things, the pros and cons about being uh, under the radar is we, out of necessity, had to focus on external markets. Like, if you look, when the early sales were coming in, we were like, man, Australia represents a fraction of the sales that we're getting. So not only is our population small, but our digital art scene is is not really firing yet. So if you, if you look at the professional arts industry, it's mainly America, China, and Europe. So that's where we threw almost all of our attention. Um, and that, that, that worked reasonably well for us. We made a lot of good connections in the industry and, and our methodology back then was just, hey, just use Procreate. Tell us if you like it, tell us how we can improve it. Uh, and, you know, back uh, nine years ago, we, we started a thing with social media. Now it's, it's pretty widespread, right? We call, it, we call it influencer marketing. But back then we were just sending people, you know, high level artists in Disney uh, and all the, you know, the highest creative industries. We were just giving them copies going, you know, tell us what you think. And if you like it, maybe say a few words on, on social. And so that started to pick up. So it worked reasonably well for us. But let, let's talk about the bad stuff. Bad stuff about flying under the radar and focusing on international markets is we spent no time developing uh, any kind of uh, community in Australia. So right now we're going through a really significant growth phase and we just can't hire quick enough. But because we spent no time on the brand of Savage, we put everything in the Procreate brand internationally and nothing into Savage. It is super hard to uh you know higher as fast as we'd like to because people like savage never heard of you guys if you know if you're in the united states and you're in the arts industry procreate's kind of like a, a household name but one of the one of the really uh difficult things about flying under the radar has been hiring but let's talk about some of the good stuff the, the good stuff is i think we're able to keep focus like unadulterated pure focus on the product because you know if you look at the valley there's there's this mentality that if you have a job for longer than you know two years something's wrong with you right like what are you doing where you haven't moved on what's going on something's bad you know something's obviously terribly wrong you haven't been able to impact change or whatever but because we're away from that kind of mentality uh you know we're removed by being in australia and then we're further removed by being in hobart and I think that's been a real benefit because I've got guys that have been with me for you know since the beginning my original engineers are still here uh, and they're still able to focus down on what matters and not get tied up in all the bullshit that goes on in the valley, you know. Yeah. Uh, and the second thing is, I think it it kind of keeps us humble because we we didn't spend time uh, at all, you know, in the startup scene. Um, we we were pretty insular, but I think that kind of kept us humble. That you know, from from the house where we had moderate sales to now where we're the leading product um on ipad and we've made a pretty good dent in the industry we're still pretty down to earth people right like we're not connected we're not because we are under the radar for, for us we're just just people doing our thing and i think that really is important because as soon as you get carried away with your own success it's you're just going to dive into a ditch right because you lose focus on what's really 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 important yeah and i think here like we've got 40 people here and we're all pretty pretty relaxed, pretty down to earth. And because we are disconnected, we, we've got a little bubble that we're kind of focusing on. The bubble is just our customers. We, we, you know, we've got great relationships with our influencers. We spend almost all of our time talking to our customers, listening to feedback. And so we've kind of created a little ecosystem within, within ourselves. And, James, and I think that's been one of the biggest things. It's been a really narrow focus. I mean, like you started in the iPad with a single product and you're still in the iPad with a single yeah. product, yeah? And I mean, that's obviously got some, the, the pros outweigh the cons, but I mean, you haven't, I mean, I, maybe with venture influence that have been like, well, you need to expand to, you know, Android and, you know, Microsoft and whatever else. Do you think that's totally. true? Totally. Yeah. Oh yeah. Look, we, we had, we had a lot of players fly down from HTC and Samsung, you know, begging us to bring our stuff over to, to their platforms. But again, it's, it's all about what, what, what is the best possible experience we can make for our for our professionals and for our um, amateur artists? What's the best experience? And so if you look at the platform scene, there's many different platforms we could go to, which would possibly uh, increase revenue. But is it going to make the product better? And is it going to make the brand better? And when yeah. you look at some of those platforms, we, we you know, 
it, it is kind of the conventional thinking that you should just get this one product and spread it across everything, which which works for some businesses. It's totally legitimate, but for our particular uh, you know niche, we wanted to make sure that we're just building the best. We actually, you know, years ago, we decided to build a Macintosh version of Procreate because we had all the pros who were like, "That's great, man," but I need a big screen. You know, I need my horsepower. And we're like, "Okay, cool. We'll, we'll get to work." So we spent like. I don't think it was like three years developing Procreate for Mac. And at the end of it, we 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 had we like we were using it, we're like, this is shit. You're like this Wacom <laughs> tablet. And you, you know, you've got this like you're, you're drawing on a desk, you know, down here on this flat surface, and you're looking at it on a monitor, and you're like, this is such a backward step. Like the iPad is incredibly powerful. Like the silicon they got in there is just insane, man. It is insane. And you're drawing directly on the surface. You're manipulating the pixels with your hands. It, it's just a totally different level. Uh, and so we realized at that point, wow, we've we've gone a step backwards. We've gone back to 1980, right? We were, yep. we were in front, now we're going back. So we actually decided to, to can that entire project. Uh, and now we've got a, a much more ambitious plan that we've been working on. And, and just quickly, like what famous uh, graphics or posters or, or things would we have seen that have been done with Procreate? It's a fair few. If you guys have seen Stranger Things, I love that yeah. show. I don't know if you guys have seen Stranger Things. Yeah. So if you look on Netflix, all that artwork was made in Procreate. Um, and if you look cool. at um, Finding Dory, uh, a lot of the storyboards were created uh, in Procreate. Logan, the movie poster uh, that was up in New York Times, uh, New York Square, etc. That was all Procreate. There, there's a lot of content out there, man. There's like a lot of content that's Procreate, that's awesome. but you just probably wouldn't know. Yeah. All right. An amazing story, as I said. So, uh, yeah, well done. And uh, yeah, a few more questions I've got Thanks, for man. you, but we'll, we'll, we'll move on. So, uh, uh, Noel, I might uh, jump over to you. Uh, I think I first came across you when you were in, you were part of Techstars Adelaide back in 2017. Now, yeah. you know, Techstars is a sort of global, uh, you know, one of the best accelerators in, in the world. Uh, and normally going through that, it would put you, you know, what I'd call firmly in the rails of traditional funding, you know, so you're going to get venture, you're going to do all the rest of it. Uh, and you've got a, a, a software service enterprise business, uh, which again, you'd normally go out and get a shitload of funding via VCs and, but you've gone against all that. Um, and so maybe just tell us a bit about Techstars and, and the history and, and why you've decided not to go down that traditional path. Yeah. Um... Well, I think firstly, when we joined Techstars or applied for Techstars, we weren't doing it to raise, which, yeah, as you said, is not typical. I think most people go down that kind of accelerator program path to get exposure to VCs and set them on a path for fundraising. We did it because uh, we're an Adelaide-based uh, company and with global ambitions, and we knew that in order to achieve that, we needed to grow our network. So. We actually applied and wanted to be part of Techstars to get access to their global network. Um, and we did that and I think we made great, great, we made great connections. We met Ian and Matt, so clearly it was awesome. Um, but I think the second thing for us as well was we didn't, we didn't need to raise. And I think that was a massive, massive part of it. Um, when we went into Techstars, I think we had six staff, so we you know, built revenue up to that. Um, we had really great growth coming into it and during the program, um, you know, we had good cash flow situations, zero churn. And so for us, we didn't need, there was no compelling financial reason to raise. And then I think because of that, when we were talking to investors in the program, it was more like, hi, like, this is interesting. Let's get to know each other as opposed to sort of like, here's the deck and this is how much we're going to raise and this is the plan. Um, so we probably didn't come across that that strongly to investors anyway. But I think for us, we when we were talking to them, I think it became quite apparent that there was going to be this artificial constraint of time put on the business. Um, obviously, there's metrics that you know where you should be in 12 months, 18 months. There's that um, you know moving exit on the horizon. And we obviously have ambitions to go fast. We always want to go faster. And, um, you know, the metrics we look at, we're always looking at well, how can we speed things up. But, but so I think we already had that self-motivation to go fast. We're just sort of questioning why we needed to add all this extra pressure of, of deadlines. Um, 
and maybe another thing as well was talking to other founders during that time there were certainly some that had had negative experiences where even even if they're great investors um, further down the track there might be misalignment at the board level around strategic direction and things like that and that's certainly not all all founders experience and i know that but it is a risk so i think for us at the time during techstars um we just felt like maybe there was it was a high risk thing to do it was putting more risk on our business that we didn't have without it and without that sort of compelling need for the for the finances like i think looking at how do we get to that next double arr we had a plan and we knew what we needed to invest in and we had the resources ourselves to invest in that so it just I think maybe for us at the time, rather than going, why didn't we take investment? We were probably looking at as a question of why would we? Yeah. And I just don't think that time with us and our mentors, we found a compelling answer to that. So we didn't. Yeah. Um, and maybe just before I finish with uh, on, on this one, uh, I mean, give us a measure of where you are now as a business. So what, what you know, what can you share? So staff numbers. Yeah. Or so um, we're at 17 people as of yesterday, a, a new employee signed up, so that's exciting. Um, we're hiring another one, so hopefully very shortly we'll be 18 people. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're on a, a steady growth path, um, you know, customers including like Westpac, Santos, NEC, um, a number of government departments around Australia. Um, so. Yeah, I think we're we're doing well, and um, obviously have you know, big plans to to do a lot more. <clears throat> All right, no, that's uh, terrific. Again, loads more to ask you, so let's uh, uh, let's move on. Uh, now, uh, Lachlan, I want to talk about BuildKite, uh, which you've been involved with uh, recently. Um, it, it, we were in the news I, actually after we asked you to be on this uh, you announced I mean it must have been either in the bank or pretty close but you got a 28 million dollar series A round from uh, Open View uh, which is a US I think Boston based VC uh, but before that I mean the only round yeah. before that was a two hundred thousand dollar angel round uh, sorry, should it include general catalyst in case you're listening and then uh, I don't want to get you in trouble. Uh, but, you, you, you know, pre previous to that was a 200 grand angel round back in 2014. So you kind of have gone down the, you know, the equity funding path, but there's this enormous gap in between, you know, 2014 with a, a pretty tiny round and, you know, uh, 2020 with a colossal round. You know, why did you not raise between uh, those two and, uh yeah, just give us give us a little bit of the, the of this story, and uh, yeah, and then I've got another question. Sure. Yeah, you know, uh, just listening to to James and Noel, I, I hear so many similarities in kind of those stories. Um, I, I think uh, why didn't why didn't we raise earlier? Uh, you know, a huge part of it was I think very similar to James, which is focus. Um, we set out to build. Uh, Bill Kite is, is a different shaped company uh, and, and kind of like a pretty straightforward one, you know, one where we could just focus on building the, the best product and focus on working closely with customers, iterating on that experience. And, uh, you know, to, to a certain extent, we, we didn't need to raise capital to do that. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I was I was actually initially. Uh, oh, I told you. I was initially a customer of Bill Cuts. <laughs> Should still be able to hear me. Yeah, no, we can hear you. Sorry, yeah. I jumped in. Keep going. Yeah, no, we can hear you. Sorry, yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Sorry, folks. <laughs> Um, so I was originally a customer uh, of Bill Kite. I was uh, founding CTO at 99designs, which is a graphic design marketplace out of Melbourne. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I fell in love with Bill Kite as a customer. And so uh, when the opportunity came up to invest, um, you know, Tim and Keith were raising a small round, actually, with, with Matt as help. Um, you know, I jumped onto that 
uh, and uh, kind of came along as a co-founder after that. But the thing that really, the thing that really resonated with me about Kim and Keith was kind of their vision, not not just for the product that they were building, which I thought, you know, Bill Cut is transformative uh, in the CI space. You know, CI is, is broken for growth companies, and the thing that Tim and Keith built and that we've built together, uh, you know, I, th I think is uh, a, a category defining product. But so there was there was that. But the thing that really resonated with me was how they were thinking about building a company. Um, and, you know, they, they wanted to build something that was different shaped and that we would all love working at in 10 years, uh, you know, or 20 years. Uh, and, and to build something that you love working at over a long time period, I think you've got to get really good at saying no to things because it's very easy to say yes to a lot of things. But uh, if you don't say no to a lot of things, I think you very quickly lose, uh, you know, your ability to focus on, on what matters to you. Uh, and whether, you know, that's like focusing on building the best product, focusing on finding the right people to work with and treating them well. And I think that was a big thing for us is that, that we wanted to be able to focus on uh, our craft and uh, treating our staff really well. And, uh, you know, the other the other thing that was really different about Bill Cut is um, we We've all come from, you know, Tim, Keith and I have all come from large orgs that have undergrown a lot of growth. And so one of the things that we all wanted to do differently was uh, see what we could do with a small team. So, you know, our philosophy was to try and do more with less. Um, and so, you know, for us, that's meant uh, trying to be really uh, conservative and thoughtful about when and how we hire people. Um, but I, I just think it, I think it's easier to build a company that you love working at if you're not like you know doubling headcount year over year uh, and just the the communication overhead that goes into that um, it end, ends up being huge. So yeah. you know, Bill Cut. The reason why the reason why it's taken us so long to raise capital uh, is you know I think kind of like Noel said we we didn't need it. So when we went into raising, uh, we went into raising not because we, we needed the money, but because we thought that for the next stage of our growth, we really needed partnerships, connections, and some amazing new shaped humans like we brought on from OpenView and General Catalyst. Yeah. Um, and that, that's been transformative for us as opposed to the capital. And, and just before I move on, uh, I mean, $28 million is a lot. I so I can't it, hear you. Oh, you can't hear me? Oh, can everyone else hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. yeah yeah all right uh, lachlan when you sort your headphones out we'll, we'll come back to you so i do a follow-up question on that one uh matt i might jump back to you uh sure. I, to, I talk about debt apologies uh, folks yeah that's all right sure. um I'm, I'm, I'm on to matt so uh, we're talking about debt uh you know you you and i have talked about this a lot uh you're, you're a big fan of the indie vc model uh you know and, and pick and shovel which is your sort of investment vehicle has got sort of a debt angle so Tell us about this. Uh, so, you know, beyond your venture world, tell us about debt. Yeah, so it's it's really interesting, um, you know, thinking about, um, you know, I always think about venture capital is kind of like two things. There are, there are a bunch of really great people who are, you know, who are all friends of ours, but, you know, it, it is a financial instrument. And that financial instrument comes with certain set of expectations and certain set of constraints. Um, and, you know, debt comes with a different set. Um, and it's really interesting, you know, debt traditionally, you know, traditional debt from a bank has come with a bunch of criteria that, you know, you must meet and banks being can very, very conservative about, you know, securing against hard assets, you know, knowledge and IP are things that banks don't understand. You know, they would look at, uh, they would look at Savage and they'd look at, at Team Gage and Bill Kite and, and would generally say, we don't understand those businesses. Um, you know, for those of us that do understand those businesses, we can see that, you know, the recurring revenue or the sales are really important. So <clears throat> the interesting thing about um, about about venture is that, you know, your your you are your, your growth. Growth is that main driver. Um, and to drive growth, there is a, um, a mindset that says every single dollar that we get needs to be put back into the company because growth is the North Star metric. Like we need to go fast. Um, you know, if if you don't need to go fast, then the, the de next question is, is how do we pull forward some of the, the processes we want to do to drive some growth without necessarily coupling ourselves to the kind of, um, you know, uh, expectations that come with that kind of capital. 
so there's 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 new ways to there's new types of of debt debt vehicles that work. So Ian Ian you know represents Lighter Capital, which is a revenue based financing model. Uh, us at Pick and Shovel and uh, a new company we're about to launch um, has a very similar model where it's a combination of a small amount of equity that is earned and and some some capital that is able to be paid back via revenue share model. So you know it, it's a it's a, a clip of your monthly revenue which floats with the company revenue. So if you have lumpy or low 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 um, months, then you know your payments go up and down with that. Um, you know, and the interesting part about that for founders and you know, and Noel is 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 was our, our very first deal we've done under this structure is that um, you know I think two things a um, we believe that that capital is aligned with with the way the founders want to grow their company. If it takes a while, that's okay. You know, strong strong steady growth is the definition of our success. Like just do the things you do and keep going and let us help you. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing we found, we found especially with Bootstrap founders, is um, uh, like like James said, they they are so customer focused that they live in a little bubble that that you know the when you kind of have these bigger sort of questions around how do we, you know, what does the next stage look like? That's a tough question, and the bank's not going to answer it. The venture guys will, but they're going to give you capital that squishes that timeline up, you know, and and is non negotiable. And then we think that there's another product around now that can sort of get the best best of both worlds. You get you know, help that sort of can help you level up. But, you know, if VC needs you to go from, you know, from one to, to 10 in the next 13 months, like we'll help you go from one to two or three. Yeah. And we think that's really, really exciting because Bill Card is the best example. You know, um, you know, uh, locks, I, I ran the numbers and you guys compounded at 9.7% per month for 75 months in a row. Like if you, if you, the, you know, as Warren, Warren Buffett, Buffett says, says, when you when interrupt you compounding, compounding, like it's the worst thing you can do. So you and just let that thing go, and time, time is your friend. Yeah. And, and and that that was with no marketing or sales folks either. You know, it's just mm. kind of like just focusing on building the right thing and working closely with your customers. Yeah. Um, um, look, I think we've still got a few challenges. So <clears throat> when you're not talking, if you can just stay on mute, because I think there is a bit of echo coming uh, back in there. So, uh, look, and we will come back to you in a sec, uh, Lachlan. But I want to jump uh, back to to James. Um, you know, because again, like we heard the amazing story about uh, Savage and Procreate, uh, and then I think you even alluded to this. I mean, from what I understand, you're you, you talked about the other uh, product people coming in and trying to convince you to build for Android, but you've also had constant calls from VCs uh, from the Valley, mostly wanting to invest in you. Uh, and if they can't get to you, then they'll pick up the phone to Faden, who you know will try and get to you. So, I mean, do you ever take these calls, uh, or I mean, what would convince you that you would ever want to do a deal with a, a, a Silicon Valley VC or any VC? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. And I think, like in the early days, uh, it was it was you know kind of um, really heartwarming to get this reach out from really large investment firms. And so we would I pick up the call like each and every time. I had no idea what I was talking about. I had no idea what to ask for. It was such a foreign kind of uh, uh, line of communication. But at a certain point, after taking uh, a few calls and going down the you know the path of discussing what a deal might look like, I think we just kind of figured out it's kind of like what Noel said a little while ago. We just didn't need it. And so I think from our point of view, it would it became a little bit of a distraction. Because we're, you know, we're putting our heart and soul into this product. And then I'd have to set up all these calls that I didn't really need. So at some point, I just kind of made the, the decision that I'm going to have to stop picking up the phone. And I get hit up like pretty much every day, um, which sounds really bad. I'm going to publicly say this, but I just don't answer them anymore. I'm sorry if anyone's watching this. It's nothing personal. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> I'm just like to the wall with so much happening here like we're 40 people but we're trying to like a major competitor is a multi-billion dollar uh, american faceless corporation called adobe and with 40 people man it is tough it is tough to try and uh build the sort of things that we're, we're trying to build market them and and also keep that strong relationship with our customers so i don't know what it would take ian i think at this point just because um as yet, we've found no partnership that can really uh, add, add value, I think, because yeah. apart from perhaps some sort of mentorship or something that uh, that might help, but thus far, we've not really required that. I mean, in the early days, we could have used an injection because we were, like, as we mentioned, it was just like a budget of a shoestring. 
but yeah. right now uh, sales are, are, are incredible. So I think uh, financially we don't really need it, and I'm not, I'm not sure what what it would take in. I, I mean, let me ask a, a slightly different one because I mean you you're hearing this concept of secondary sales coming along. So uh, you know, Safety Culture, for example, you know they raised sixty million bucks recently, but and none of that went into the company. It was all to buy out uh, either original investors, which doesn't apply in your case, but you know where I'm getting to is staff. Uh, I mean, you've got a bunch of loyal staff who are on the payroll. I mean, at any point, do do they? I mean, have you got an employee share scheme? Is that something you, you you think about? And if so, then would you ever consider giving them a an injection so they can pay off their mortgage or buy a Tesla or or whatever they might want to do? That is most certainly our ambition. Like we, we want everyone here to benefit. At the moment, because we are, and I can't talk exactly about the plan, but we are in the middle of a very ambitious plan. We're kind of pushing towards that next that next business uh, horizon. Once that's completed, then we'll be uh, having some of those discussions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, it's that, and that actually is less about VC in the traditional sense. I mean, I think that deal from Safety Culture, and I think Luke's gone public with us a minute. That the investor was not really interested in the business management. They just wanted some ownership and and see some of the upside, you know. So none of that control or gotchas that normally come in were were there. But a lot of the original staff, uh, you know, and investors benefited hugely from it. So, yeah, it's, it's maybe a, a different question, you know, because what we focused on here is all around growth. And you ask that, uh, that, ask locks. <laughs> yeah, Lachlan. Yeah, and that was very much, uh, you know, why we we. Uh, decided to raise money what was initially we we're planning to do an entirely secondary shaped round um you know with a lot of those motivations like uh, i think my um you know my co-founder keith described it really well as as uh, you know he, he was thinking of it like a safe point for founders and for staff um you know we, we've we've you know philosophy has always been uh you know build a long-term sustainable business and to us that means one that needs to be profitable and one that pays out dividends for returns um, but you know the 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 thing about uh, the thing about a little bit of capital is is that it uh, it's kind of the same as about ten years worth of dividends. And uh, for for in terms of kind of looking after people that have been around for a long while, uh, it just made a whole lot of sense for us to look at that secondary option. Yeah. Um, all right. Ian, can I can yeah, I just chime in there, Ian? Yeah. Um, yeah, Bill Kite and and there's a few other companies I'm working with at the moment that are doing this exact process, which is, you know, when you're growing fast, you're profitable, and you go out to the market and say, hey, listen, we've we've you know these founders have all their eggs in one basket. This thing is you know five years old, however long it is, and and it's been growing really well. You know, we want to de-risk it. So this is all about de-risking, right? And 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 like, like Keith says, it is a bit of a save point in your game of life. And if you get a save point that's, you know, you, you, you might, might own a house and, you know, Keith paid his parents' mortgage off and just a few things that were just like, I'm good now. And turning back around and going back to work and still owning the absolute vast majority of your company. Um, and also not, you know, if you do it right, you're able to run the company in the exact same manner. Like the term sheets that Bill Kite, you know, signed had so, uh, they're all in the favour of running the company in the exact same way, which is profitable you know, dividends, all the same thing. So, you know, there is a there is a really exciting sort of point where a founder can have a conversation with external investors and say, you know, we're going to take some of this money off the table. We'll put some in the company, so it's so it's going to be able to you know level up a little bit. But we're not changing the way we do stuff. It's like this is the way it's done. You know, like get in and come along with us, or not at all, right? And that's that's, yeah. that's such a powerful position to be. Yeah, that, that was it. Sorry, go on, Noel. Yeah, Noel, you jump in. Well, I was just going to say, um, yeah. So we have we have an ESOP too, and I, yeah, I think that this sort of this narrative that you're either sort of an employee in a VC backed company and you'll get maybe a share of an exit event, or you go bootstrapped and you don't get anything is, um, I think that's really false. And I think mm -hmm. you know, it's a perfect example of that. In in some ways, I think that. The bootstrap founders I know have more compelling reasons to reward their staff. I think for us, you know, we have um, we actually have a revenue share program, not a, not profit share, no. actual revenue share that we distribute with our team. I'm pretty sure um, if we had a, a VC board, they, you know, not not want that. Um, so that you know that that's money that could be used for extra growth. But for us, you know, we 
we're a really purpose-driven organisation. One of our values is we're all in this together and sometimes it's it's really a hard slog. So it's a really positive thing that we're able to do that along the way as well as obviously having this ESOP at the end of it as well. So, yeah, I think there's, there's a, um, often a really good uh, upside for employees in, in bootstrap companies. Yeah. All right, let's take uh, a few questions from the audience. Probably got uh, quite a few a few minutes left. Um, so one from Fiona McLeod. I'm not sure this applies to any any of you specifically. So Matt, I might ask you as a generalist in this one. So your view on bootstrapping a product that's reliant on network effect, i.e. scale, uh, before you get revenue. So I, I don't know, this could be a consumer product or uh, a social network or something. Is it feasible that you can bootstrap that Without, um, without external funding, Matt? Yeah, uh, look, the short answer is not not easily. Like, um, you know, a lot of the, the, the products that are that need scale before you can re you monetize whichever mechanism you choose to do so, um, you know, it's usually a function of time and a function of product. You know, if you've got a different way to fund it, so, you know, people that quite often, you know, have these are the things you can take a little bit more time on the side. You know, if you've got a business or whatever, you know, a normal services business and you want to run it on the side or you've just got a job but you're right um you know things that require a lot of capital um uh probably not not bootstrap bull, not easily anyway you know um all of these companies on the call today you know solve a problem that people pay for from day one and i think it's a probably the venn diagram between you know people that charge by day one and bootstrappers is almost a circle there's a few on the edges that may not be true but you know it to, to directly answer that question, it, it, it can be a challenge, you know, unless you build a really good product and goes really fast, really quickly, then I'm sure you can find a way to make some money out of it. Yeah. Um, all right, look, let's talk about regionality. Uh, I think I'm the only one here uh, and I happen to be the only VC uh, and I'm based in Sydney. Uh, you know, and again, is, is, is there something about being in the, in the regional capitals? Uh, and again, uh, forgive me, uh, Matt and Lachlan, uh, Melbourne is not a regional capital, but uh, it's not Sydney. Uh, it's more likely that you're going to skew VC funding if you're not in Sydney. Maybe let's ask it that way. I don't know. None of us has taken VC funding. We don't know. Uh, maybe the wrong crowd, Ian. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's no doubt the fact that, you know, I don't regularly meet the coffee with, you know, the biggest VCs down in Adelaide. Um, oh, I mean, I, that probably that has to play a part, right? It's it's we're less known about, we're less connected into that network. Um, yeah, I think I think in some ways it does play a part, but I think there's there's many more reasons that go into like regional companies and the way we do things compared to maybe Sydney ones. But I, I think it has to play a part. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think you're right, Noel. I think it forms kind of a part of your DNA. Like, because you're not connected to the whole ecosystem, you become kind of like island culture, right? Like, island culture is because you can't migrate across borders, you have to become incredibly self-reliant. Uh, and I think the, the kind of the smaller capital cities, you have to become self-reliant on yourself and, and uh, your local network. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think it, I think it kind of does form a part of who we are. Yeah, I also think that like the stage is global now, like locks, you know, our VCs, our Bill Kite, you know, partners, you know, flew over from Boston, you know, and ended up fly flying from Boston to Perth, like the long way, you know, like, like it, it, regional, I think is, is, is in the eye of the beholder now, um, you know, when you've got a company that's doing really well, and, and James alluded the same thing, like, ultimately, the, you know, you say Sydney, and then if you ask anyone who's not from Australia, will go where? So like it's all you know it, it doesn't yeah. matter. I genuinely believe it doesn't matter. Um, you know, I, yeah, I have a, I have a personal focus on on Australia, New Zealand, just because it's you know it's easier for me. But you know, there's lots of people who don't. Yeah, I think there's another interesting hypothesis here that um, maybe by a, being able to bootstrap from a region um, might increase the diversity of founders we can have. So. Um, like, as an example, when we were talking to investors, yeah, the Australian ones were like, are you going to move to Sydney? The US ones, like, are you going to move to the US? And at the time, I had, like, an 18-month-old, and I think, like, having my support network around me of family that 
that actually enabled me to work the way I did, the hours I did. Um, if I had moved, uh, Ben and I are co-founders as husband and wife, I think I would have been, had been able to have far less involvement in the company. So being able to do it from Adelaide, yeah, and, and maybe that goes for others as well, that, you know, it takes a village to raise our, our children. And as a female founder, I think it's important that I can stay close to my family, which is my village, enables me to be more involved. So. Yeah. I don't think that's others' experience, but that's my hypothesis. I, I actually, so at, at the kind of last company I helped build, 99 Designs, kind of, I went through that experience of, you know, we raised a, a whole lot of money from US VC and I moved to San Francisco for three years. And, uh, you know, coming back here with my, my wife to start a family, it was kind of a, a big part of, you know, one, what we wanted to do in Bill Card as well was, uh, you know, ha have a company where, uh, the, the focus was on like, well, you know, how do you want to live your life? What's the best What's the best way for you to work? And what's the best way for you to kind of engage as opposed to like going where the money is or, uh, you know, kind of going where the markets are. So, you know, for the early days of, uh, for the early days of Bill Kite, Keith kind of traveled around the world as well. And that that's, uh, you know, we're a remote company now with kind of people across uh, like six or seven continents. Um, you know, at, at which point it kind of stops being an Australian company and it's kind of more like, uh, you know, an internet company, which, which is which is what we're trying to build. All right, we've got uh, just ticked over 50, so let's take a few more questions. Uh, VJ Solanke, uh, he's a great question. Thank you, VJ. Uh, and this uh, is directed at Matt Allen, but um, uh, we will maybe get input from everyone. So is there a simple model or rule of thumb to figure out if you are bootstrappable? Matt? Uh, I think I'll just go back to the same thing. Is it like, uh, it's actually what all the founders today have said, is that if you can reduce, you know, the surface area of the problem you're solving down so that the, the, the customer base is small and you can talk to them directly, hopefully with authority, and the problem's big enough to charge money for from day one, you can bootstrap yeah. that thing. Like, that's it, right? Like, that, that's the criteria. Um, and, and, and everybody said the same thing today, which is like the relationship with the customer is far more important than the relationship with, with 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 investors. Like like I talk about like founder energy units. Like if you spend one founder energy unit to, to a customer, um, you know the yield should be a hundred x speaking to an investor, right? Like and, and if you've got that and you've got that kind of engagement, then like don't be afraid to charge them money if you're solving a real problem. Like that's kind of the, the key to bootstrapping, right? You can't do it for free. You're not a philanthropist. <laughs> you're, 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 you know, you're a founder. So like that, I think is the, the main criteria. Yeah, that is a great answer. Anyone else want to jump in on that before we move on? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think Matt's spot on. Yeah, that's spot on. I think if you treat it like a business, so you've got to have cash flow, even if it's small cash flow in the early days, it's still cash flow and you can start, forecasting and planning it's going to be tough it's going to be tough as hell but yeah. um it is possible as long as you treat it in the sense that you you require the operation to be profitable yeah and there's a related question just come in from kim uh kim chandler mcdonald uh you know perspective on uh bootstrapping either b2b or b2c products i mean my instinct here is that it's probably easier with b2b but uh you know b2c feasible yeah I mean it is. It's, it's as long as you've got a revenue stream, right? So the the like, if you were to sort of zoom out a little bit and look at a macro thing, is like, if you need to invest a bunch of capital before there's any revenue or or the proportion of revenue coming in through expenses is is disproportionate, you can't bootstrap that thing, right? Or you 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 can't put your company into a state into that state and bootstrap it because you'll just run out of money. Yeah. So you know, it, it's it's actually directly coupled with how much value you're pro providing to your customer and whether or not you can they'll pay you for it. So you know, a lot of these B two C companies that are nice to haves, not need to haves, you know, may not be able to to generate enough revenue to, to run it. Or conversely, keep your costs really low, yeah. right? You keep your costs really low. And I think a lot of this, like I alluded to in the beginning, is like the definition of success here is about your definition of success and like forget what the VCs say, like unicorns are fucking stupid for the vast majority of people building technology companies. Go and build something that's successful for you, you know, and there's people around you, you know, me included, who like ask Noel, like our definition of success is not compatible with venture yet. And it may not get there at all, but in the meantime, it's not, you know, if it's not working, it's, it's awful. You know, you're not VC backed and important or you're not, 
there's a spectrum in between there. And I think that, you know, the vast majority of companies will, will live inside there. The, you know, and you invest in 1% of the companies you talk to, maybe, maybe a little bit more. You know, there's not 99 out of 100 founders that are running terrible companies. There's just 99 that aren't compatible with venture when you talk to them. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. But I think that's, a, 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 you know, these are all great answers. Um, uh, let's take another one. Uh, we are probably down to the last question or two. Uh, any, this is from Melissa Morell. Uh, any suggestions for resources for bootstrappers outside of generous VCs? Huh. Uh, for example, Slack channels, boots, podcasts, newsletters, sites, Jim. Can I just jump in real quick? There's a book uh, called Zero to Sold um, uh, that a dude who um, who started a bootstrap company and then sold it for, for quite a lot. The guy only came out a month or two ago. Arvid, his name is. Um, is Zero to Sold. Oh, is it just us or have we lost Matt? Oh, I think we've lost Matt. Oh, yeah, sorry, Matt. You went on mute there. Oh, yeah. Uh, James, were you going to say something? Uh Sorry, Matt, I'll just jump in while you're getting that sorted. Yeah, th there's not a lot of resources because the traditional method is, of course, you know, very different to bootstrapping. There's not a lot of resources out there. But I can recommend if you can find a couple of people who have done it. I've taken a few calls, just people reaching out on LinkedIn going like, you know, can you give me a couple of pointers? I'm just starting out. And I've got a lot of kind of sympathy for that, even though I'm, you know, really cut for time. I think because there isn't a lot of resources around, I think those of us that have accomplished it, need to kind of it's our responsibility to reach back out and kind of help people kind of point them in the right direction because you're out there blind man it's 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 tough and i think what matt was saying earlier on about just trying to cut the cost down and stuff i mean these are simple business practices but unless someone's out there saying look it's going to be okay it can be pretty terrifying yeah and uh, yeah, because I suppose part of it, I mean, you're trying to recruit a lot of people right now. Uh, and I guess that's hard from a small base. Like, um, you know, I know COVID shut the borders, but I mean, are you going to offer generous relocation packages for great developers from Sydney or Melbourne or Adelaide? In the uh, early days, it was. <laughs> Noel, she doesn't want to, doesn't want to lose the course. Adelaide talent. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, off limits. Now, look. In the early days, it was it was tough because we couldn't offer the you know the crazy salaries that uh, people are expecting from the valley, and people didn't know what the hell we were doing. Now it's fine. Now we're we're you know we're it's just a matter of finding the right type of talent. You know what I mean? There's there's lots of capable people, but to, to find that right type of uh, cultural fit is is a little difficult. And then COVID's put an added uh, pressure on us because we've got like uh, an employee in New Zealand. We can't get her here because of uh, issues. We've had candidates in Brisbane. We've had issues. Even our recruiter, we couldn't get her uh, down quick enough because uh, of the, you know, the, the laws and there was no exemption, even though, you know, she was an essential worker. We won't go down that path, but uh, it's, it, it, it is, it's still tough, but uh, for different reasons. Yeah. You know? All right. Look, um, I see that Claire has now opened the sessions and networking, so I think people will start getting gravitating over there. So look, why don't we wrap at this point and uh, don't jump over there yet because I've got to explain it, but let me just give a quick thank you, a huge thank you, uh, Matt, James, Noel, Lachlan. Uh, that was terrific, a really fantastic insights. Uh, I think a lot of lessons for everyone in there. So uh, I'm going to boot you all off of the stage so uh, you can leave, but please don't go anywhere. If you've got time to hang around, uh, please do. Uh, and whilst you exit the stage, uh, which, yeah, I need to exit so I Thanks can everyone. button. <laughs> Shoo. I'll see you in a sec. See ya. Right, thank you. All right, let me put on uh, my screen share quickly um, and talk about what is going on. So that was what we just did. Uh, what, uh, yeah, so like at a moment, we're going to invite you to to network with the other attendees or come to these sessions. Um, so, yeah, as I said before, sessions are for the group conversations and the networking's for one-on-one. -on -one, so you can uh, try both or try one. You don't have to participate, but um, Claire's manning a help desk. Uh, so I think when you're in the sessions, uh, there is a help desk uh, icon. So if you're really struggling, then uh, try, try that. Claire will help you. Um, just quickly, we are back next week. Uh, we're exploring recruitment uh, and why a down downturn is the best time to hire your A-team. There is some incredible talent out there right now. Uh, so if you are able to recruit, then this is absolutely the best time to do it. So really looking forward to that. We're just uh, finalizing the panel now, so we'll have that uh, uh, very soon. 
uh, but you can sign up, I think, on the website. Uh, I had a, a great podcast uh, last week. Uh, I went over to David Shane's house in Point Piper. So uh, he came to South Africa, I think, in the late 70s and uh, created a business. Uh, 14 years later, he sold it for a billion dollars to um, Dimension Data. He's a lovely guy. He's now a VC with our innovation fund. Uh, yeah, really terrific story. Uh, I'm a huge fan of David, so do check that one out. It was uh, uh, I've always got favorites, uh, but this is my latest favorite. So yeah, I really enjoyed that one. Uh, just quickly, thank you again, uh, our national sponsors. We could not do this without them, so we so, so appreciate their help. So Macquarie, KPMG, uh, Farmark Ventures. Um, all right, uh, it is time for us to to go and network. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining. Hop over to the sessions. Uh, I've been your host, Ian Gardner, so we're here to support you, and I will see you in the sessions. See you over there.